Welcome back. In this video, I'm going to talk about interaction terms in linear models. They're the last building block in making our linear regression models complete. So, what are they about? Typically, when we put multiple predictors into a model, we assume that the effects just add up. That the effects are independent of the value any other predictor has. Clearly, sometimes that's not true. If it's cold outside, whether or not it leads to more accident depends on whether or not it rains at the same time. So if the impact of one variable, the amount of rainfall, depends on another variable, the temperature, then we can say that those two variables interact. And that's something we need to account for explicitly in our linear models. So, to look at another example in more detail, we might wonder whether chess players have a particularly good memory when it comes to recalling chess boards. So, we might test this experimentally, um, get a group of people um, who are either chess experts or just novices to look at chess boards, um, remember the configurations and reproduce them. And then we would quite likely see this kind of pattern that experts recall more of the boards without making any errors than novices. If we ran a linear model on this, this would be, would be our very standard linear model where we have an intercept, the intercept is the average for novices, and we have an effect of expertise, which is the parameter for expertise applied if the case is actually an expert. The question we're answering with that is, is an effect of being an expert, quite, quite straightforward. However, with the data we just saw, we can't yet really tell what this is about. Is it just about chess players developing good memory? Is it about chess players having good memory before they start? So we might want to, to dig deeper into this by testing whether the memory advantage is specific to chess games. And one study that has been done a couple of times um, for this is to let people look at different kinds of chess boards, either real configurations that could actually occur in a game or random configurations that could not imagine in, uh, that could not arise in a natural game. And when you do that, you get a very different pattern of results. So in the real games we see what we saw before, experts are better than novices. In the fake games, there is no, or at least a much smaller performance difference. So it seems to me that those two variables interact. The variable of whether the participant is an expert or a novice chess player, and the variable whether the chess configuration is real or not. Um, you, can, you can look at this paper by Gobbett and Simon if you're interested. But if we try to turn this into a linear model, the linear model becomes a bit more complicated because we have a second predictor variable. So far, it's now just a case of multiple rather than simple linear regression. We would be able to answer whether there's an effect of being an expert and there's an effect of um, whether or not a position is real. However, this model wouldn't be able to describe the reality we just saw on the chart because that reality is that the effect of the position being fake or real depends on whether the player is an expert or not. So for that we need a more complicated linear model. We we'll just add one extra term. So, we, so again we have the intercept, we have an effect of, of, an, of expertise, we have an effect of the realness of the position, and now we have a term where those two are multiplied, where those two are, appear together. And that last term is what the interaction is all about. And then in the presence of an interaction effect, we call the other effects main effects. So right now we are interested in two main effects, an effect of expertise, an effect of the position type, and an interaction between the two of them. And now we can test this with the normal LM function. Um, we just need to add the interaction uh, to the formula. Um, and we do that 
but there's a colon between the two variables. So we have our standard formula, um, player type, position type, and then we add the interaction between the two. And we can see that in fact this interaction now shows up at the last line. It is significant because there's a low p-value and um, it, has, it has a coefficient that indicates the impact of an expert looking at a true chess position. However, we now have quite a lot of different coefficients to make sense of here. So it's best to move quite quickly to a plot. So to use this to see, well, is there a significant interaction? There is, and then look at a plot to, to figure out what the interaction actually looks like. Before we do that, just a quick comment about the formula syntax. I already said you can add an interaction with the colon operator between the two variables, or you can use a shortcut and use the multiplication operator instead of the plus. So then I only have player times type, and that gives me the two main effects and the interaction. So if we now um, use the interactions package and save the LM model into a variable, we can run an interaction plot um, with the cat plot for categorical plot um, function, and it looks like this. So here we can now see um, one line for each type of position and two columns for the player types. And those two lines are not parallel, which indicates that something different is going on for the different types of positions, depending on whether the player is, is a novice or an expert. So such non-parallel lines are what we're looking for if we're looking for an interaction. Quite clearly in this case, the difference between novices and experts only shows up for real positions and doesn't really show up for fake positions. A different, more specific way of talking about interactions is to talk about them in terms of moderation. And the idea of moderation is that we have one moderator and one predictor variable, and the moderator changes the effect of the predictor. And usually the reason for talking about it is because that's what our research question is about. So here, quite clearly, our research question is not whether it's easier to remember real or fake chess positions, but the research question is about what influences the effect, the effect of player expertise. So the, the models we estimate do not distinguish between them, but the plots do and the interpretation does. So when you hear of moderation, it's just a way of testing interaction with this hypothesis that one variable influences the effect of another variable. The moderator influences the effect of the predictor on the outcome variable under consideration. So this was the most straightforward case of interaction between two categorical variables with two levels. Because we might have more than two levels. And in, uh, in the study that I'm drawing this uh, data from, they had quite a few more levels. One interesting one was that they also had mirrored positions. So they said, well, if chess players actually remember full chess boards, then even giving them just a mirror image should already disrupt their mental processes. So they added that as an extra condition. If we now run a linear model on that data set, we see that we have two interaction terms that are now both significant. Whenever we have more than one interaction term, plotting becomes really quite essential. So we can run exactly the same plot again. And here we can now see that clearly there is still an interaction going on, but two of the lines are now clearly parallel. So there is no different relationship of expertise to the mirrored positions than there is to the real positions. 
those doesn't seem to be a main effect. Mirrored positions seem to have the same, seem to lead to the same number of mistakes as real positions. But that's something where you would want to be um, sure and actually do proper testing um, with the model. If we just have three conditions, we might actually go, go about it this way. However, we need to be aware of, of multiple comparisons. So if we have too many lines, it will no longer work to just plot all the lines and see whether any of them are non-parallel. Then we do need to return to the idea of an omnibus test. An omnibus test is again testing whether the addition of a specific term to the model significantly improves the model. In this case here, we can take the fitted model, put it into the ANOVA function, then we get one line for the interaction that shows that that particular uh, interaction term across all the levels, and there might be many of them, has a significant effect. And that's how we would report it using the F statistic and then go into pairwise comparisons. Sometimes that might be essential if we're interested in whether some association um, between two variables is moderated by the state in TS, looking at uh, electoral primaries, for example, we would have 50 interaction terms. So clearly it makes sense to first ask, do they collectively contribute something? And then go into the details. That's what the omnibus test is about. Quite often, we're not just interested in categorical predictors, but also in continuous predictors. Some things are very similar when we look at interactions with continuous predictors, some things are a little bit uh, more complicated. Um, but let's consider an example um, and say we're interested in the link between obesity and negative feelings. And we're also interested in whether that might be related to gender. We can do that uh, using the data from the European Social Survey, um, the 2014 data set that we looked at before. And if we now run a normal plot in ggplot, where we map body mass index on the x-axis, the frequency of negative feelings or depression on the y-axis, and specify that we want um, gender to be mapped to color and therefore that we want a separate line per gender, actually ggplot automatically includes the interaction. So it's, it's a very easy way to get into exploration. And here there seems to be some evidence for an interaction because the two lines are in parallel. But of course they will never be exactly parallel. So, so it's important to not rely on this, this visual testing. There also seems to be a main effect. The line for women seems to be higher at all points. But which, which of these um, effects are actually significant? So with three effects, women might be more prone to depression than men. Obesity might be associated with depression and there might be an interaction indicated by the fact that the lines are not parallel. To figure out which of these effects are significant, we need to go back to formal testing with the LM function. In, in a first attempt, we might just do it by adding the two predictors into the model, neglecting an interaction. If we do that, um, we get a model output that suggests that, well, body mass index predicts a greater frequency of experiencing negative emotions, so does being female, both highly significant. However, if there's an interaction and we don't have the interaction in our model, 
then we are missing, missing out on important information. So it's worth running the model also including the interaction term. And now we see that in fact the interaction is significant while the effect of, be, of the respondent being female is no longer significant. And the association of BMI with the frequency of experiencing ne negative emotions for men, since women are now accounted for in the, in the interaction term, is only marginally significant. So quite a different pattern here. And it's important to bear that in mind that whether or not we consider interaction terms can actually really change model interpretation. If we only have the second model, we are no longer going to talk about women experiencing negative emotions more frequently. The only evidence we get from the second model is that for women, obesity has a greater impact on life satisfaction than it is for men. So it can make sense to look at the main effects in the absence of an interaction, like we did in the first model, to just recognize interesting patterns in, in our data, and then to look at the interactions to make sure that we learn about boundary conditions, about limitations, that we can start to think about mechanisms. We look at some more examples in class and discuss what interactions can tell us. For now, to complete the tour through the different patterns of interactions, let's look at what happens with two continuous variables. So, sticking to the ESS dataset, we might be curious whether working hours and household income predict life satisfaction and actually whether the two interact. I've now done this again uh, with the ESS 2014 data, this time with data from the UK. And if we run this model with the interaction term, we see that actually working hours don't seem to have an effect. Income clearly does have an effect, household income, but there also is an interaction. And while I'd stay away from really looking all that much at the coefficients because they all have different units here, it's worth looking at the sign of the coefficient. We see that the sign is negative, so we know that having a lot of income and working many hours together has a negative effect. But clearly we need to make more sense of this, of this interaction. So how do we do that? Well, firstly, by really figuring out what we are asking. So one thing that we might be asking is the typical moderation question. So how does the effect of income vary depending on working hours? If we want to answer that, the way to do it is to run a so-called simple slopes analysis. And that's just about picking a couple of specific values for working hours and then calculate the slope that income has at those particular values of working hours. Typically that's done at the mean of the moderator, one standard deviation below the mean, one standard deviation above the mean, so that we get three different slopes that describe the effect of income on life satisfaction. The sim slopes function in the interactions package can do that. And then when we have these slopes, it's quite natural to plot them in a way that's very similar to the interaction plots we saw earlier. So in this case, we would use the interaction plot function and we would get this plot. We now have three lines that show the relationship between income and life satisfaction at different levels of working hours. Of course, given that working hours is a continuous variable, these three lines just illustrate the space, the different slopes 
that they are depending on working hours, but they allow us to see that for higher incomes, actually working more is associated with lower life satisfaction than working less. We might quite specifically be interested in that way of looking at the data, so not in the slope of income, or you might actually wonder when are working hours related to happiness. From the main effect, we see that on average they are not. But our question for the interaction model might also be when are they actually related? And that's what the Johnson Lehman technique um, allows us to do, because that now calculates the slope that working hours, or that either of the two variables has, at each value of the other variable, and then figures out where that slope is significant. So the Johnson Lehman function um, can do that, and then we get this rather complex looking plot that now plots the slope of working hours at all values of household income. But the main thing to just look at is where the blue line is. Because on, on one side, where we have the blue shading, we have a significant effect of working hours on life satisfaction, on the other side we don't. So here we can see, in this particular data set, only the top three deciles, so the top 30% by income, are affected, are negatively affected by working hours. This is another way of making sense of an interaction between two um, continuous variables that's not constrained by the, by, the, by the idea of there being one moderator. So what to remember? First and most important thing is that linear models in their most basic form assume that each predictor has an independent effect, irrespective of the other predictors. If that's not the case, if the effect of one predictor varies based on the value of another predictor, we need to account for these interactions explicitly. Quite often, it makes the most sense to think about it in terms of moderation, where we clearly hypothesize that our key interest is in the relationship between one predictor and the outcome, and that then the secondary question is how that relationship is affected by a moderator. That just allows us to ask two very clear questions if we don't assign such roles to the variables, it can get much more confusing. Interactions are possible between any combination of categorical and continuous variables. There can also be more than two variables, then it just quickly gets rather complicated or difficult to interpret. Interactions can be added to the novel LM function call either with the colon operator to add individual interactions or with the asterisk or with the multiplication symbol as a shortcut for getting the main effects and the interactions. And in general, interactions are best interpreted by quite quickly moving to the plots. The interactions plot, the interactions package offers the plots. I showed you here and we'll practice that in class. So I'll see you there.